Well, I'm delighted to be joined here today by Dr. Alexandre Mabaza, who joins us from Paris, France. My name's Amanda Vest from Tufts in Boston. And we've just heard the presentation of the Strong HF study, which was really exciting and potentially very practice changing for us all. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about why you did this study? In fact, when we uh, did this study, um, originally I, I was really, I hate acute heart failure. It's my area of research, but really seeing those patients coming mm -hmm. and doing this big decompensation uh, with the low oxygen saturation, their family are scared, just because the, the therapy is not well, uh, well done, or implementation is not well done, it's really unfair for those patients. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I thought really we need to do something. And you know the literature is full of papers saying mm -hmm. that really we are not doing so well. And, and maybe because I am intensivist, I, I felt we should not be so scared about the safety issue of beta mm -hmm. blocker and ACE. Mm -hmm. And the image I also got is that oncologist uh, when you go to see an oncologist and, and he discover cancer, he never say, okay, we give you a quarter of the dose in three months and a half and one year. They say, come Wednesday, mm -hmm. we give you a full dose and we give you a small card. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there is infection or fever or whatever, you call us and we handle it. And, and then I thought for heart failure, we should do the same. We, should, we give a full dose and then we check mm -hmm. whether there is a safety issue and, and we handle the safety issue. Th this was really the only original idea. Mm. And for those who haven't seen the study so far, um, you um, should know that it builds on some prior data regarding the importance of up titration of medications early, either during or shortly after a heart failure hospitalization. We have some data, um, for example, for spironolactone and the um, Arnie medications there, and also builds in this frequent contact with a clinician um, and we're delighted to see that this does improve outcomes for patients. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about your protocol? Yeah, the protocol combines the two, which is, as you said, frequent visits and uh, optimization. And I think uh, what we did is sometimes the visits could be just shaking hands because we are busy. Mm -hmm. And how are you? Oh, I'm breathing better than the three months ago. Then we say, okay, bye-bye. We hope to see you in three months. And in fact, here we put like a true procedure and we said to the cardiologist, you should follow the procedure. Mm -hmm. And the procedure is the following. The patient comes, goes to the, to the lab to have a few exams, mm -hmm. antiprobe, BNP, potassium, creatinine, and hemoglobin. He comes with the results, enters for the visits, and then uh, the uh, investigator were looking on the clinical exam, whether there is edema or not, blood pressure, heart rate, as mm -hmm. simple as that. And by combining everything, he was, he was uh, giving a green light to increase the, the doses of the drugs. Then mm -hmm. before, in the high intensity arm, before being discharged, he received half beta blocker and half ACE, or uh, RAS inhibitor, and half spironolactone. Mm -hmm. And then week one, safety, exactly mm -hmm. what I just described. And week two is the crucial point, is he check all the green light. If there is no red light, floop, he increased to 100% with no discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no, I come, uh, no, 100%. Mm -hmm. And then week three, we check that the 100% worked well, and then we see again the patient at week six and, uh, and uh, 90 days. And in fact, apparently the, the people liked and the, the cardiologist felt secure mm -hmm. to see this procedure. And we told them, if you have one signs which is red, no worries, you just ask, the, you, you don't change anything, you just ask the patient to come one week, week later, mm -hmm. and often after one week, that red light turns to green light because congestion uh, left, because they had uh, diuretics, because potassium is back to normal uh, levels, mm -hmm. and then they will uh, increase to 100% of the three drugs. Mm. So how often were patients seen on average in the intensive arm versus the usual care? In the usual care, then patients where we were writing a report and they were followed by cardiologists in town, those ones, we, we saw them at 90 days. Then mm -hmm. for us, they, they had an average one visit done by the investigators. Mm -hmm. In the other arm, they had an average of five visits. Mm -hmm. That means that really people followed the protocol and the protocol, the protocol was really helpful because we had the three, visit, the three weekly visits just after discharge and then six weeks and 90 days. Brilliant. And can you summarize what your findings were between those two groups? First, uh, I mean, did it work for implementation? The answer is yes. Uh, if you combine the full optimal dose of beta blocker and uh, RAS inhibitor and spironolactone, if you combine 
full dose and, and minimum of half dose, we had more than 80%, 80% mm -hmm. of the patients who had half to full of the three uh, classes of drug. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that uh, the patients got those drugs because when you look on uh, heart rate, it was decreased, mm -hmm. blood pressure was decreased, creatin um, potassium was a little bit increased and creatinine was stable. And uh, one of the first surprises is uh, to look on the signs of congestion. Mm -hmm. This is still not the primary endpoint, but all the parameters of congestion were improved yes. within three months, showing that again, diuretics is a, it's classically a decongestive therapy, but if you give a full therapy, mm -hmm. full oral therapy, already we are resolving many of the congestion issues. Uh, then again, all the congestion signs, I mean, at least were, were markedly reduced at 90 days. And the primary endpoint was 180 days heart failure readmission and death, and, and that was markedly improved in the uh, high intensity uh, care arm. Mm -hmm with uh, yeah, much less events in that arm compared to the usual care arm. Mm -hmm. and, and the other parameter that we feel it's really very important is quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask the patient how, the, how they feel and, and quality of life was much more improved and really patient basically liked so much being on the high intensity care arm. Mm -hmm. And here again, you, you hear many people saying, ah, oh, but they don't like to be on the full dose of beta blocker A's, etc. And in fact, people felt that they're they're really doing better than, than before. Mm -hmm. um, concerning the other secondary endpoint, and this is mortality, only mortality 180 days. It was not statistically uh, significant, but there was a trend toward a better uh, survival rate in the uh, mm -hmm. high intensity care. And I think these results are very much welcomed by the cardiology community because they prove something that we thought might be the case. Uh, we had some studies suggesting to us that the benefits of optimizing GDMT uh, can be really quite quick in terms of re uh, reducing heart failure rehospitalizations and also mortality. And some weaker data showing that an early follow-up after discharge is beneficial. And of course, that was included um, as an ideal, uh, a contact with the patient within seven days of discharge in the 2022 heart failure guidelines. So it's really nice to see them brought together in a randomized controlled trial uh, and give us this very encouraging endpoint, which I think will be quite practice changing. Really helpful to both explain to our patients and payers and healthcare systems that this is important and works. Um, and if I may ask you, I was surprised to see that you'd recruited patients across the ejection fraction spectrum mm -hmm. uh, with a cut point at 40% on the uh, subgroup analysis for ejection fraction. And those patients with an ejection fraction over 40% were still seeing similar benefits with really no gradation of effect across the ejection fraction spectrum, which was sometimes seen for medications um, in the heart failure world. What do you take of that? Is it okay to be up titrating these medicines as, as briskly, including beta blockers in the HEFPEF population? population, or is the effect mainly in the heart failure with mildly reduced strata? First, I'm going to tell you a story. It's funny because there are a few countries where the ethics committee um, uh, rejected the protocol because mm -hmm. they said there is no recommendation to give beta blocker to, to have PEF. Right. But um, in fact, the reason why we put acute have PEF is because it's known today that half of the patients coming to any emergency room in the world half of those patients have a preserved ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. This is known. Mm -hmm. and then I felt that there is no way we will exclude them from, from, mm -hmm. from this trial. Then, then we put them there. The other idea I had also is that m many of those patients with acute HEF-PEF, they have hypertension, mm -hmm. they have a coronary disease, and those patients may, may benefit from that. And the third thing is many of the data we published, it's a retrospective analysis, but when we looked on the uh, association between discharge medication and acute HEFPEF, we consistently saw positive results. Mm -hmm. And really combining all together, we felt that we should really put those patients. And as you said, the results is surprisingly, really, I was mm -hmm. really, because when you do retrospective analysis, you know, you don't necessarily see the same for mm -hmm. a prospective trial. And, and the results is that they are doing as well as patients with a reduced mm -hmm. ejection fraction. And what are your takes on the adverse effects of this rapid uptitration in the vulnerable post-discharge transition period? Yeah, I think you're you are asking a very good question because again, the, the main reason why cardiologists, physicians all around mm -hmm. the world are not uptitrating those drugs, mostly uh, ACE, spironolactone, and uh, 
RAS inhibitors, pyranolactone and beta blockers, because they are scared of the, uh, mm -hmm. the side effect. And in fact, we, we, we really showed that uh, people should be relaxed. Mm -hmm. And these are a few tricks, as I told you, some red and, and green line uh, to, to pay attention on. But we could see uh, an increase in the uh, adverse, effect and, uh, adverse effect in the uh, high intensity arm, which we believe is related to a much higher number of visits. Uh, I mean, we believe that if you see the patient five times compared to one, by definition, you're doing a lot of biological exams and you're going to detect things. But when we look on the serious and fatal serious uh, adverse event, they were really the same mm -hmm. in the two arms. Mm -hmm. Very encouraging. Um, what do you take of the adherence piece? How do patients do up titrating all these medicines all at one time early on? Um, could we see any drop off in terms of adherence longer term? It's also a very, very good question. In fact, what we see, uh, and you can see it rather well in the paper in Lancet, you see that when the up titration is done at two weeks, there is almost no change up to 180 days. You see a little bit of change, but roughly, the patient will stay on the same medication. Mm -hmm. And I think this supports the fact that we really need to teach strong, teach all, teach all the tricks for strong, because as soon as the, the physicians up titrate at week two, he's so happy mm -hmm. because really he achieved like a, a big positive results, then he doesn't change anything and, and the patient is not going to do any side effect during the following months. Then again, between two weeks and 180 days, there are almost no change. Mm -hmm. And although there was a great difference between the usual care and the intensive care groups in terms of the amount of medication patients got onto. We're still nowhere near 100% for reaching these target doses of our medications. What do you think could help there in future or what are we missing? What we, what we are going to analyze more deeply the data. The, I think the question that we should raise, what I'd like to raise in the next months, and this comes from a paper that maybe you have seen recently, showing that maybe in trace to half of the dose would be uh, enough compared mm -hmm. to three quarters mm. of the dose and full dose. And what we will try to see is, you're right, only 50% had a full dose of the three medications. And the idea is to see in the other 50%, when you combine half of one, half of the dose in, in one category and full dose of the mm -hmm. others or other combinations, whether this, the fact that you combine at the level between half and more, whether this is enough to prevent rehospitalization and survival. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to get your take on the SGLT2 inhibitors. Of course, this study started before they became part of our standard foundational care um, for um, HEFREF and now also HEFPEF. Some have suggested that it may add to the complexity to have a fourth medicine in your protocol, whereas I wonder actually in some patients whether it may be an opportunity because of those up titrations of, for example, an ARNI or a beta blocker sometimes being difficult in that transition period. Yeah, I, I would say maybe it is worth to do another strong trial with SGLT2. Mm -hmm. But personally, for our patients, I feel totally comfortable mm -hmm. to just add SGLT2 on the top of the three medications. We know that the safety issue will more come from the three initial classes, RAS inhibitor, beta blocker, and, and spironolactone, and much less with, uh, with uh, SGLT2. But uh, maybe a study, or maybe if the society is immediately accept to recommend that the four will follow the, uh, mm -hmm. the strong HF procedure, it would be fine as well. But again, I think there is no safety issue by adding SGLT2 on the top of the three others. Mm -hmm. And quite significant benefits as we've seen. The sure. time to benefit for the addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor is in the matter of weeks. Absolutely. What do you think about the implications for our systems of care? We often work in multidisciplinary teams, mm -hmm. and I understand in Strong HF, it was mainly a physician, a cardiologist, mm -hmm. up titrating these medicines. Um, but what do you see for the optimal implementation um, out there in real life? We have our PharmDs, our RNs, our advanced providers. We have the option of in-person visits and telehealth in some settings mm -hmm. as well. What do you envisage being the next step? Uh, the, the comments I start to uh, hear from some friends, they say, Alex, you are going to uh, multiply my visits. I'm already busy. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are two answers to, to this. First, usually a heart failure patient is seen two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. And here what we are proposing is just to condense them in the phase after mm -hmm. acute heart failure. I think what we, we, what we didn't do for years, we didn't think that really acute heart failure is just a sign of decompensation. Mm -hmm. It's a sign that the, in the month and years before the decompensation, we didn't do a, a great job because mm -hmm. the patients were not optimally treated. 
then when the patient does the acute heart failure, we should really in the following weeks try to do the maximum to try to optimize those patients. Mm -hmm. Then instead of seeing them for several months, let, let's condense maybe this, those three visits mm -hmm. or four visits and, and make sure that almost all of them goes to 50 to 100% of, of the three or four classes of drug. Mm -hmm. This is my first answer. My second answer, and this needs also a small trial, is I, I am a strong believer that maybe the two safety visits, mm -hmm. uh, visit week one and, and week three, they could be done very easily by a, uh, by a, a heart failure nurse. It could be done at home. Mm -hmm. Then I think as soon as the procedure is understood by the team, Mm -hmm. uh, many things can, can be done, as you said, by telemonitoring or remote monitoring. I, today, I still believe that the week two needs really to, to mm -hmm. be done at the hospital because in case we need an echo, we need something. Mm -hmm. But I think the other ones can be done uh, differently, remote or differently. And then basically we are back to, to like, let's say, to a normal life. Mm -hmm. But the advantage is at week two, the patient is, uh, is fully optimized. Excellent. Well, thank you ever so much for talking us through this excellent trial. Um, I think many of us are very motivated and excited to see how we take the pearls of what you've learned and translate them into our multidisciplinary teams, coordinating care and making those outcomes better for patients. So thank you so much. Thank you.